So turn your Bible with me to Genesis 28, and we'll pick up in the middle of the paragraph, verse 16, and we'll go through chapter 29, verse 1. This is the Word of God. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a full, I give a full tenth to you. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Thus far the reading of God's word this morning. Amen. Now you remember we touched on it a little bit last week in our study of this dream. In John chapter 1, the soon-to-be disciple named Nathaniel was introduced to Jesus by Philip. Nathaniel was a believing, uh, scripture-studying, practicing student of the Old Testament scriptures. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel coming his way, he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael and Philip both received the promise, the prophecy that Jesus said in response to them, You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That declaration tells us that Jacob's vision is about Christ. It wasn't just to encourage Jacob out there in the middle of nowhere in this wilderness called Bethel, uh, that he was uh, to be the next patriarch in the Old Testament and that his descendants would be uh, form into the nation of Israel alone and that would be it. The covenant people of God is the church of Jesus Christ. That is the message of that vision. We are the ones who rejoice today in the fulfillment of Jesus' words to Nathaniel and that his church would be fully built and fully complete by this God, this God-man who laid down his life and rose up again. As Ephesians 4 tells us, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, uh, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So this cowardly adventure that Jacob is now on will seem almost, as we get into it, uh, will seem almost a comedy of sin and error to us, but its purpose is greater now, we understand, than just to fill out the story of this foolish man and his adventures. The Lord appears to him in a great vision, but Jacob will still do all he can to resist his God. But its purpose is greater than just to, uh, just to allow him to do that. And it will lead Jacob to submit to the Lord in the end. Now, Jacob wakes with a start and in awe of all that he had just experienced. But even though the Lord has appeared to Jacob uh, in such a monumental and even messianic way, that doesn't mean that Jacob was immediately persuaded. That doesn't mean he was converted, if you will, by this dream in such a, a way, uh, to a personal faith, to a, a personal relationship with the living God. Even when an individual is completely converted in a moment, uh, at some specific point in time, 
when they can be, remember it and recall it easily. Years later, I, you know, I was in a Bible study. I was at a church retreat. I was in a hospital and my loved one was dying. I was at Boardwalk Chapel. Uh, even if the heart is spiritually completely changed in a moment, that doesn't mean that the mind immediately and comprehends everything about this God who has all of a sudden broken into their lives and, who he, and what he expects of us. And the heart has, although the heart has been changed so that the person will be devoted to the Lord, getting to know this Lord and learning how to obey is a lifelong charge and duty, a lifelong struggle with temptation, with sin, with repentance, with forgiveness, ever, ever again with forgiveness. When Saul, you remember, was confronted with the risen Christ uh, in Acts chapter 9, he he had already had a thorough education in the Scriptures. He was going to be a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And yet even so, after that, after that confrontation, he went back and he spent years in Tarsus, his hometown, where he was able to learn of the Old Testament Scriptures all over again, realizing now that it's all about Christ. And he did that for that long, before he was in a position to have Barnabas invite him to go and to teach at the church in Antioch and then commit himself to a lifetime of missionary service to the Gentiles. But you know, such instantaneous conversions are not the history of every Christian in their experience. Some come to faith very slowly. Come, come to faith over a very long period of time during which the Lord reveals Himself more and more in steps until finally, in a, a decisive moment, finally does come when the person is able to completely bow the knee. John Bunyan recounts that kind of thing in his own personal experience in the allegorical work that he wrote called Pilgrim's Progress. At first, the main character is only burdened by a sense of guilt that his sin has put upon him and that fear of the judgment that is yet to come. And he's learned of that judgment. His belief in that judgment was indeed the first step of God working on his soul, but he needed more. He needed the gospel. And then he met a man named Evangelist. And Evangelist pointed him in the right way to pursue uh, to seek hope in the light and in the gate. But it was only much later, even after passing through that gate, that he found what he was seeking. He was finally confronted with the cross of Christ and with the empty tomb. He realized that the gift of Christ was for him and for his own salvation. And in worshiping at the foot of the cross, the guilt on his back finally rolled off and was gone. Jacob will be brought to the Lord. He is indeed the one called of God to be the very next patriarch, the next man of faith. But it won't be that night. Now some, I will have to let you know, some have thought this moment to be Jacob's conversion. But I think that there are several clues given here that reveal to us in his reaction that he is not yet ready to give his heart to God. And as we examine this account of this reaction, I want you to ask yourself, do I see myself in that same kind of situation Maybe I have not yet come to look to the Lord fully myself. The first clue in Jacob's reaction here is he makes the common religious mistake of thinking that he has stumbled into a place where God dwells. In other words, he thinks he's found a holy space. How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven Holy space is a curious sort of notion. 
All religions seem to have such places. Temples, mosques, meditation gardens, etc. They're all described as places where a seeker may find his God and where spiritual communion can take place. Even through Christian, throughout Christian history, Christianity has been no different. During the first millennium, church buildings and then cathedrals were being built by engineers just developing designs and evolving abilities with Mason's work to make worship places more spectacular and awesome with every coming age. They were becoming larger and more impressive in grandeur and in beauty and in strength. The robes and the vestments and the titles of the religious personnel became more and more impressive, more and more prestigious. And the formality of worship became more and more elaborate, more and more symbolic, while the meaning of religion slid more and more into superstition. It wasn't until the Reformation that the truth of the Word of God taught clearly and boldly to Christians the emphasis and the focus that holy places were not what we should look at, but rather holy gatherings. It isn't the church building that makes up space holy. It is a gathering of God's people calling on God's name. And that can be done anywhere and anytime. You see, my friends, unbelief needs space from God. Space apart from God. Jacob may have been drawn a step closer to God here, but he is still not interested in being that close. His emphasis here on Bethel being a, a holy space is, in truth, just a way to insulate himself from the truth that he is always coram Deo, that he is always before the face of God. The second clue here is how Jacob reveres this place that he thinks is holy. Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Now, it's okay to regard a house of worship with some respect. You know, I hear, I hear that kind of thing all the time. Maybe it's for my benefit I hear it whenever parents are telling their children not to run, not to shout, in the sanctuary. My friends, sanctuary is a word that means holy space. This is not a holy space. That's why I use the term worship room. Another example is even though someone might have been Protestant all their lives, he will still refer to this as the altar. Ever done that? That language comes from the Roman Catholic Church. Presbyterians do not have an altar. We have a communion table. You know, but while all that's, all that's understandable, it is not okay to use that language in order for you to separate parts of your life into a religious, secular distinction where one day of the week I'm all holy and I'm supposed to be God's man and the rest of the week is all about me and I do what I want. All your life, every minute of your life, every day of your life, the Christian lives for the glory of God. That happens, for example, when somebody says to you, yeah, I'm afraid it's been a while since I've been to church. What that really means is the man has no, or the woman, has no reverence for God. He does not want to worship God as God. He does not want a relationship with the Lord because he would have to change his life. He would have to acknowledge his sin and his need of repentance. He would have to embrace the gospel. 
submit to Christ as Savior, and obey the commands of God. And because he's not about to do that, he just never gets around to going to church anymore. Unbelief, you see, needs to put God in a box. If God is over there, away from me, then I can live quite nicely over here. The third clue that we get from this is after honoring the place, honoring this place as being a holy space, Jacob leaves it behind. He puts distance between himself and this place where God is. Now, now I, I know he's on a journey and he cannot linger, but I am struck by how he first worships the place, he first sets up the pillar, he anoints it, he names it, and then he promptly leaves it. I remember a very elaborate church building I was in once, where every single piece of furniture in the building, in the, in the worship room of this church, every single piece of furniture had a plaque on it with the name, this was donated by... It was a nice bronze plaque on every single item. And as the elder was showing me all of these things, he said with a grin, he said, you know, the one whose name is on there never darkened the door of this church. Unbelief can be disguised, you see, with distant respect. People might think highly of you for the things that you do for and to the church of Christ, but God, my friends, is after your soul, and He is not flattered with your gifts. He doesn't ask, what can you do for me? He says, what must you do in my name? What must you do before my presence? How must you change your life? Isaiah writes in chapter 1, bring no, speaking as God would speak to the Israelites, bring no more vain offerings. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Well, the fourth clue that Jacob gives us here is that he bargains. He makes promises to God. That's a giveaway, isn't it? When somebody bargains or makes promises to God, you know the insincerity reigns in their hearts. Now, positively, this can be overlooked. Jacob may well be anxious about his future. It could well be said that he may sincerely need God and is asking God to be there for him when he needs him. You know, we read of Gideon in the book of Judges who needed assurance of God's God's presence. When he left the the fleece out overnight, he wanted to make sure God would be there. He was going to take, he was going to stand up to his idolic father. He had to know that God was there. Young faith needs that kind of assurance. And God is not above giving it when that new believer is sincere. If you are new to the faith, if you are new to this, ask of God. He will hear you. He will be with you. He will not leave you. But Jacob's words, to my mind, are proud. If God will be with me, keep me, give me. And worst of all, of course, Jacob makes promises that if God will be faithful to him, he will reward God. He promises to return to this place and even will even give a full tenth. I I, I don't know what that maybe maybe instead of a half a tenth, part of a tenth. I'm not sure what a full tenth is. He probably had heard that story, you see, from his grandfather meeting up with Melchizedek after the battle when Abraham gave to Melchizedek a tenth. 
But my friends, the tithe is not your reward to God for His being faithful. It is your worship. It is your due before the Lord. How hard the heart can be when God indeed proves Himself to be so faithful to you and yet you will not worship Him in that way. Unbelief, you see, makes requirements of God. And even if God cares for Jacob as he wants, Jacob still has yet no intention of bowing the knee to God. I wonder, do you see yourself in any of these clues? Are you still trying anything to keep God at a distance? Uh, are you trying to put him in a box? Do you revere uh, a holy space so that you can leave it? Does God have something to, to say to you one minute, but you listen to the world for the rest of the week? You know, even King David, in his pride, wanted to build God a house. But the Lord told David, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. I have been with you wherever you went, and I will make for you a great name. Moreover, the Lord will make you a house. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That house, brothers and sisters, is not the temple. It's the church of Jesus Christ. God's dwelling is not a holy building, but a holy people. As Peter later described, Christians are living stones. Living stones that are being built up into a spiritual house, which will outlast the gates of hell and will be the place where God will dwell with His people forever. If you are to be a part of that holy dwelling... The Spirit of God must not only be in your heart. Christ must be welcomed there. He must dwell in your heart as His own abode. In, uh, in 1954, uh, a man named uh, Robert Munger wrote a book entitled My Heart, Christ's Home. It's, it's a very good book to read. There's a reduced copy of it in booklet form that I have put in the Inquirer's class notebook for 20 years. It's always been there because it speaks so well. It's an allegory of what it truly means to receive Christ into your life. First, you know, people welcome Jesus as a guest. It's like coming into the foyer and you're led into the living room where nothing ever happens. And it's all fine and vacuumed and dusted and clean. And like any guest, Jesus is welcome there for a while. And then he's expected to leave. But Jesus wants uh, to inspect the rest of your house heart. He wants to see your library. He wants to see your den. He wants to see what you watch. He wants to see what you read. He wants to see what you fill your mind with on a regular basis. Then he wants to be in your dining room. He wants to see what you normally feed on, how much you give yourself to the pleasures of the flesh. And he proceeds to visit every room in your heart, the closet where you hide things. The bathroom with its vanity mirror and the makeup and the bedroom where all of the intimate secrets are kept. 
And finally, you know what he says? Now I want the deed. I want the title to your heart. It's mine. And you must give it to him. Jesus is not just a guest. He's not just somebody who comes into your life for a while and is formal and pleasant and leaves. He must be your Lord. He must own your life. Jacob will learn this, but it won't be that night. He's got a lot to learn until he finally gets there. Maybe you do too. It's okay. Just know what the Lord is calling you for. Know what's expected of you. Know that he's not going to be satisfied with just the veneer that you want to put in front of him. He's going to crawl out of that box you've put him in. He's going to draw you near when you want to keep him distant. And when you want to worship a place, he's going to say the place is your heart. And I hope he does it to you soon. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you very much that we are able to reflect on what happens to this one man. Because we know what's coming for him and we know that you will... Uh, wear him down. You will even break this man in order that he will be your man. Father, we pray that you, because we recognize and acknowledge you are that same ownership that you have upon Jacob, you have upon us, that we belong to you. Help us to admit and to embrace that. To even rejoice in it, Lord, because those who have given themselves to Christ know They've made no better decision in their lives. Father, we thank you for the joy of the gospel and for the thanksgiving we can have both now and when we gather together around your throne. In Jesus' name, amen.